So let's get started with prayer. We'll pray that prayer like we were talking about from our prayer challenge. And like I was saying earlier, this is, if I had to do everything all over again, I was training somebody through this process of, of what we do in the Abundant Life Blueprint. I think the number one thing, the first thing I would want to get, want to get established with somebody in their life is to get this prayer challenge prayer implemented. This is what I pray personally for myself, my family, for you guys, uh, for everybody connected to me. I pray this, pray this, and then doing the other half of prayer, taking just a couple minutes to get still and to listen and help God or let God, let him, let it go and let God, like we talk about often, let it go, let God help to navigate your day. And then it's about saying, all right, what do I know to do today? And then executing those things that I know to do, not the things that I'm still uncertain on. What do I know that I know that I know that I need to do today for certain? I got peace about it and I know I need to get it done today. Maybe you've been procrastinating on it because we're worried about all these other things and getting this prayer established and then executing day by day, doing what you know to do and then focusing on doing it with a good attitude, doing it with peace and joy and confidence in him, trusting that he's there helping you. And as you stay more in that present moment, you're going to experience his grace flowing more and more. But if I had to start over fresh with someone brand new, this would be the one thing that I would want to get established in their lives first. Let's pray this prayer every day. Let's take a couple minutes to listen and plan your day with God and then do what you know to do. Do it with a good attitude and stay plugged in, stay listening as you go throughout your day, just in case he tries to redirect your path. He tries to, like a GPS, recalculate and we're going to go a different direction because we've got a roadblock coming up up here. But getting that established in our lives first, I believe, is the first place that I would start. But let's get started with the prayer. Heavenly Father, I just pray for everybody who's here and all those that will be watching the replay, all of our families, friends, those connected to us, and all of our church and governmental leaders. And Lord, I just thank you for releasing us from the darkness, for transferring us into the light, into the kingdom of your dear son. I thank you for your purpose and grace given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. I just thank you for all the good that you've done in our lives. And I just keep asking that you, the father of glory, would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened to know the hope to which you've called us and the riches of your glorious inheritance that is in us and the immeasurable greatness of your power to us who believe. The same power that you exercised in Christ when you raised him from the dead and seated him at your right hand, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And you put all things under his feet and made him to be the head of the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And Father, we ask you to bless us. Bless our time here together. Let us all come away with practical things that we can implement along with feeling encouraged and inspired and enlightened and challenged all at the same time. And we ask you to expand our borders and our territory expand our capacity to receive your purpose and your grace and your love and your goodness and to let it flow through us so that we do good and are a blessing to people all over the world and keep your hand on us and help us do today what's right and best in your eyes and to do it with peace and joy and confidence in you and we ask you to stretch out your hand to heal and do signs and wonders and keep us from evil and pain through the mighty name of Jesus Amen. All right. So if you aren't consistently praying that prayer, does it have to be exactly that prayer? No. But I found that that's a, that prayer is mostly scripture. And I see God answering it in new and amazing ways almost every single day. And then, like I said, doing the other half of prayer. And if you want, if you need the tool to plan your day with, you can go to the website, the Abundant Life Training Center dot com on the free tools and resources page you'll see uh, the 30-day prayer challenge on there. And there's, if you click on that link, there's a tracker that you can use to pray that prayer and then take the time to listen and plan your day with God and evaluate. Was I operating in God's peace and joy today? Did I execute with peace and joy today? Or did it feel heavy? Did it feel like I had sorrow? Like I wasn't having a good attitude about my work as I was going about it? And the answer is either yes or no. 
like we talked about before, I was for a while there, I was rating my levels of peace and joy, like one to 10. My, my peace was a five today. And God had to kind of correct me on that to say, you know what? It's either yes or no. Either you had my peace and my joy functioning and flowing in your life today at greater and greater levels, or you did not. It's either yes or no. There is no uh, gray area. It's black or white. And I believe if you'll get that established, I think if you do two things, you'll get that established in your life. Pray that prayer regularly. Do what you know to do. Execute with the right attitude and presence and joy. And I think if you'll take communion regularly, and we've been putting out the daily communion messages. We give about a 20-minute message every day where there's a communion meditation, and we take communion together. If you're doing it on the video, you can do it with me uh, every single day. If you'll do those two things, I think that's the beginning and the end. We talk about often the beginning and the end. If you get those in place, everything in the middle tends to work out. I think if you'll do those two things, it'll keep you on the path and it'll keep you from drifting down some wrong paths maybe in life of where you don't want to be going. But we're starting the new month, June 1st today. And yearly cycle-wise, we crossed over the Feast of Pentecost which was the midpoint of the year. And now we're moving on to the other side of the year. This is the, the side of year for action. I want you to think on or off, either it's on and we're taking action, doing the things that we know to do or we're not. This is the time where we're activating our faith uh, as we move toward the fall. This is a time to play more defense, to be uh, also at the same time being proactive, walking out our faith and activating it and put it into practice the things that we know to do. So, as I was praying about our message for the month this month, this word just kept coming to mind over and over again, which is anointed. This word anointed. We've been talking over the last several weeks about how God can establish us. And we have to get God's love. We have to get the righteousness that we've been given in Jesus. We have to get his righteousness, his word, his love, all of that rooted and established in our hearts. We talked about how God has established this covenant with us. He's given us this covenant of steadfast love and grace, and he's fixed, and he's establishing it. He's never changing. He's unwavering in it. He's made a commitment to love us unconditionally and do good for us all the time, to give us grace all the time, and he's given us everything that he has in Christ, and he's already established that. He's doing it, but then we have to get that rooted and established in our own hearts, and God is able to help us get established. And to be established means to be fixed. It means to be consistent. It means to be steadfast. It means to be uh, set in place permanently. And we looked at some scriptures over the last couple of weeks that said, when our hearts are steadfast, when our hearts are established in God's love and his word, these types of things, that we are free from fear. Because perfect love casts out all fear. And when the fear is gone, this faith arises and we begin to speak by faith. We begin to speak decrees. We begin to speak God's promises over our lives. And one of the best ways to get his word, his love, his righteousness established in our hearts is through meditation. Meditation, meditating on his word, to mutter it, to recite it, to rehearse it, to rehear it, to keep speaking it over and over even going for a walk. And one of the things I like to do since learning this, just going for a walk and just speaking these promises over and over and reciting them and practicing them so that at the time when you need them, they come into your mind and they come out of your mouth and they're ready to go stored up in your heart at the time when you need them. But then as we're going to see here, there's a progression. We, we talk a lot about how God stacks things and he does things in order. Well, look at the order here and it's God. Second Corinthians chapter one, Verse 21, and it's God who establishes us with you in Christ. So first we get established, get established, and he has anointed us. And he has anointed us. To be anointed, we're going to see here, anointing, to anoint something is to smear with oil or some kind of fat. And this is a shepherding term, actually. Shepherds used to take their sheep, and they would have a problem where bugs and insects and these types of things would get into the sheep's ears and would cause infections and cause all kinds of problems with the health of the sheep. And so the shepherds would take oil and smear it over the ears of the sheep and it would keep the insects and the bugs out of their ears. So think about that. Have you ever heard the, the expression or the term, hey, you're getting a bug in your ear. You get these thoughts that shouldn't be there. You get these imaginations that begin to spring up. 
on the inside. The anointing is one of the things that can help us to get rid of those things. We're going to see the anointing has to do with grace of God has anointed you for a spe specific position in the body of Christ. We were going to see kings were anointed, priests were anointed. They were anointed for a specific position that God had appointed them to. We're going to see anointing has a connection with health, just like the health of the sheep. We're going to see the anointing has to do with the Holy Spirit. We're going to see Jesus was Jesus Christ. The word Christ means the anointed one. It's not his last name. It's not Jesus Christ. Christ is not his last name. Christ means the anointed one of God. And so we're going to take a look at this idea of the anointing. What does it mean to be anointed? I'm going to start with, we're going to read this chapter just to get a little context on this verse here. But I'm going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And I'm going to read this in the Amplified Bible. I'm going to read this off of my phone in the Amplified Bible. And then we're going to take a look at some other scriptures on this idea of the anointing or being anointed. And so this is 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to start in the beginning of the chapter just for some context on this verse. And from the Amplified Bible, it says, this is, our, this is our reason for proud confidence. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world in general and especially toward you with pure motives and godly sincerity, not in human wisdom, but in the grace of God, that is his gracious loving kindness that leads people to Christ and spiritual maturity. Notice there, it's God's kindness and his grace that leads people to repentance. It leads us to Christ. It leads us to want to repent. It leads us to grow and to mature. Kindness and goodness and grace is what changes hearts. We think it's harsh treatment and all these, you know, condemning people, that's not what causes people to change. It's gracious, loving kindness that leads people to Christ and spiritual maturity. That's what causes us to grow. It's grace, as I believe it's Titus. Grace teaches us to say no to ungodly living. That's what it teaches us in the book of Titus. For we write you nothing other than what you read and understand. There's no double meaning in what we say. And I hope you will accurately understand divine things until the end just as you have already partially understood us and one day will recognize that you can be proud of us just as we are of you in the day of our Lord Jesus. It was with this confidence that I planned at first to visit you so that you might receive twice a token of grace. I like that phrase, a token of grace. That is, I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and then to come back to you on my return from Macedonia and have you send me on my way to Judea. So then, was I indecisive or capricious when I was originally planning this? Or the things I plan, do I plan in a self-serving way, like a worldly man, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? But as surely as God is faithful and means what he says, our message to you is not yes and no at the same time. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me, among us by me, Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no but has proved to be yes in him, true and faithful, the divine yes affirming God's promises. For as many are the promises of God in Christ, they are all answered yes. So Paul says, do I make indecisive plans? So one of the biggest things we've talked about over the last week is faith is decisive. When we're in faith, we're making firm decisions. As long as we're wavering, nothing happens. If we're wavering back and forth between two options, nothing happens. It's interesting, uh, a couple of days ago in the daily communion message, we talked about Job, I believe it's 22, 28, where it says, if you will decree a thing, it will be established for you. Well, that word decree a thing in Hebrew, the, the original Greek, that word can be translated as decree, but it can also be translated as to cut, to cut away, or to divide it. So you can say, hey, I'm going to cut off this option and I'm going to decide to go God's way. It says if you'll cut a thing and then speak the promise, then it will be established for you. So if you'll make a firm decision that, hey, I'm going to do this God's way and you'll speak the promise over it, then it will be established to you. But as long as we waver, what I've learned, nothing happens. As soon as you make a firm decision and you commit to it, all, this, all of a sudden things get put in motion very quickly. Stuff starts happening very quickly. But as long as we're wavering back and forth between two things, nothing happens. It's like we're at a standstill. But it says here, all of God's promises in Christ are yes and amen. 
means everything God has promised. People wondered, oh, is that for us? Is that for the Jewish people? Is that for this? Is that for this? Whatever God has promised is yes and amen. So we're going to be talking about tonight, finding some promises that maybe you can stand on for individual things that you've got going on in your life. So if we then continue on in verse 21, now it is God who establishes and confirms us in joint fellowship with you in Christ. So he establishes us. He establishes us. He helps us get firm and fixed and steadfast. How does he do it? By his grace and loving kindness, he helps us grow and get this established in our hearts to the place where we are firm and steadfast and established and fixed. He helps us get to that place. And then when he has done that, and he has anointed us, he's anointed us, empowering us with the gifts of the Spirit. So part of this anointing is he's empowering us with gifts, where God has anointed us for a specific purpose, a specific role, an appointed task that he has for us. And it is he who also put his seal on us. That is, he has appropriated us and certified us as his. God's given us a certification. He's accredited us. Jesus, it says, was accredited as one who God approved. He has certified and appropriated and accredited us and has given us his Holy Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. And it's like a security deposit to guarantee the fulfillment of his promise of eternal life. But I call on God as my soul's witness that it was to spare you pain and discouragement that I did not come again to Corinth. Not that we rule like dictators over your faith, but rather we work with you for the increase of your joy for you in the faith. You stand firm in your conviction that Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, is the Son of God through whom we obtain eternal salvation. So let's look at a few more scriptures on this idea of anointed or anointing, and then we're going to open it up from there. So pull these up here. So Exodus 40 verses 9 and 10. This is when the tabernacle was built in the wilderness, when Moses's tabernacle was being built in the wilderness. God told Moses, then you shall take the anointing oil. So they had a special anointing oil that God showed them how to formulate and had uh, incense and perfumes and, and fragrant things that were mixed in the olive oil. And the specific combination of it was very special. And they were not to make any other oil like it. This specific oil was for anointing, for anointing the tabernacle and the priests and these types of things. It was a very special oil that they used and a special formula that they used. He says, anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and consecrate it. Notice the anointing makes something consecrated, credited, accredited, set apart, all these types of things, and all of its furniture so that it may become holy. Notice when something's anointed, it becomes holy. What does it mean to be holy? It means to be set apart for a special purpose. Holy is the opposite of common in the Bible. You shall also anoint the altar of burnt offering and all of its utensils and consecrate the altar so that the altar may become most holy. Leviticus 8, 12. And I believe this is Moses. And Moses poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head so Aaron was becoming the high priest. Jesus is our high priest now. He was becoming the high priest. Moses poured the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him, to anointed him to what? Set him apart for that role of the high priest. Think about David. David was also anointed as king. It says when he was anointed as king, the spirit rushed on him. Think of almost like Pentecost in an individual time. The spirit rushed on him after he was anointed. Isaiah 61.1, this, this is the passage that Jesus quotes when he's reading from the scroll. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, and to proclaim the year of the Lord, the year of God's grace, the acceptable year of the Lord. Psalms 20, verse 6, now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. So God saves his anointed. You'll see a theme in the Bible. Don't touch the Lord's anointed. Don't touch his anointed people. Psalm 23. Most of you are familiar with Psalms 23. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. 
Exodus 30, 32. This is talking about the oil that Moses had made, that special anointing oil. It shall not be poured on the body of an ordinary person. That oil was not to be used on an ordinary person. You shall make no other like it in composition. It is holy and it shall be holy to you, that anointing oil. Isaiah 10, 27. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. There's power that comes with this anointing to break off things that are binding us and restricting us and holding us back. Things that we can't break off in our own natural strength. The anointing that's on us can break those things. So like I said, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ means the anointed one. Acts 10.38. So we saw in the Old Testament. Now we're going to get into the New Testament a little bit. Acts 10.38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. He anointed him with what? The Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good. Healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Breaking that yoke. For God was with him. Hebrews 1.9. Talking about Jesus. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God... Your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness. Often talks about the oil of joy beyond your companions. Mark 6, 13. This is the disciples. Jesus sends out the disciples. And it says, The disciples cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. And the book of James says, If any of you are sick, call on the elders and have them anoint you with oil and the prayer of faith will cause you to be healed and rise up. 1 John 2.27 But the anointing that you received from him. So we've been given an anointing. And it abides in us. And we have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything. And is true. And is no lie. Just as it has taught you. Abide in him. So that anointing is in you. It's on you already. God has given you this anointing. There's healing in it. There's power in it. There's uh, a special appointment, appointment or assignment or position for you in the body of Christ that comes with this anointing. First John, and we talk about no ordinary person. God did not make you to be an ordinary person. He's already set you apart. He has something prepared for you in Christ before the foundation of the world. And he's set you apart for something. First John 2.20, but you've been anointed by the Holy One. This is talking about you. You've been anointed by the Holy One, and you have what? All knowledge. You all have knowledge. You have an anointing already. So, interesting things about the anointing. Anointing is, there seems to be a connection with touch and the anointing. When the garments and things that were anointed in the temple were anointed, they, were, they became holy and set apart. And the things that they touched also became holy. Whatever an anointed priest touched would also become holy in the process. Think about Jesus. Whatever he touched, people made, were made whole and healed when they were touched. It says in the Old Testament, do not touch my anointed ones. David talks about not killing Saul, even though Saul is chasing after him. He chooses not to kill Saul. Because he said, I'm not going to lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. He knew better. And so I think what God is saying tonight, God's going to establish us. He's given us this anointing that has healing. It can break the yoke. It's got our appointment or assignment in it. It separates us for a special purpose. And I think the, the leading that I'm getting from God here is this idea of we get established and we begin to decree a thing. And so I think there are, whatever you need a breakthrough in, wherever you need to see some fruit in, what I want to do the rest of tonight, we're going to open it up here in just a minute, is talk about, all right, is there a specific promise? All of the promises in Christ are yes and amen. Is there a specific promise that you can begin to stand on? If you don't have one right now, maybe we can collaborate together and we can find, help each other find some promises that we can begin to stand on for those areas. And what do we do once we find those promises? Number one, we begin to meditate on them. 
Begin to take that promise and recite it, rehearse it, keep rereading it, keep imagining it, keep pondering it, keep talking about it. And then eventually, as that thing gets established in your heart, it's going to start to come out of you in the form of statements and decisive actions and decrees and these types of things. And I believe it will come out in an anointed way that's going to change some circumstances, hopefully. But I'm going to open it up here and maybe we can discuss some specific promises that we can begin to stand on for some of those areas.